Good evening, everyone. And if you're tuning in after the fact and watching the recording of this, well, hello to whatever time of day you happen to be watching this. Uh, my name is John Harry. I am the Programs and Marketing Fellow at the Milwaukee County Historical Society. Uh, joining us tonight for a fantastic presentation about not only Milwaukee socialist uh, history, but how to tell that story through exhibits and documentaries. Uh, we have our, our Milwaukee County Historical Society curator, Ben Barbera, as well as um, some maybe familiar media people uh, that you might know, um, and the producers of a new P PBS documentary about Milwaukee's uh, socialist history, uh, Mike Boucher and Lynn Sprangers. Uh, so we'll be uh, starting that in just a second. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit about what's going on with the Historical Society real quick to let you uh, grab a beverage, get comfy in your seat for what is sure to be uh, a great conversation about uh, a very unique time in Milwaukee's history. Um, we do have a bike tour this Saturday that is sold out. So if you're hoping for that, you have to wait till August. We do have some tickets remaining for August, though. If you go to milwaukeehistory.net, you can find uh, tickets for that. Uh, it's got kind of along the political theme of Milwaukee founding, which is important because we have a political exhibit up right now. Better, Bigger, Brighter. 150 Years of Milwaukee Politics is on display through November. Uh, our curator, who you see here, Ben Barbera, uh, tells the pretty complete story of Milwaukee's politics, not just the socialism part, but uh, through uh, throughout uh, Milwaukee's history. So uh, make sure that you come join us at the Historical Society for that. Again, through the November elections, those are uh, going to be on display. And we are taking massive health and safety measures to make sure that you uh, can watch uh, or uh, come see our museum uh, very safely. Um, so we have uh, a hand sanitizer everywhere, everything's wiped down, masks are required, um, and we have it cleaned uh, rigorously on a very regular basis. Um, so if you uh, want to come down, we are open Mondays through Saturdays, um, and you can uh, uh, you can come see uh, all the, uh, the those uh, things with the political exhibit as well as our feature exhibit from this year, revealed Milwaukee's unseen treasures, some of which is political. Political, uh, but some of the cool things that uh, Milwaukee has to offer uh, and in our collections too, we have those as well. Uh, the next talk coming up is in two weeks. Next week, we do not have a talk, uh, but we would be starting the state fair in about two weeks, which is crazy to think about. Um, and so uh, you can go get your cream puffs to go and uh, the beer is cheaper at home, so there's something. Um, but uh, we, we're doing a, a History of the State Fair with our uh, assistant archivist, Steve Schaffer, uh, coming up in two weeks. So look out on our Facebook page for that. I uh, also need to say that we are very thankful to be partnering tonight with uh, the Milwaukee PBS uh, Facebook page as well. Um, and that organization, obviously the uh, documentary that you'll be hearing about tonight uh, was broadcast on PBS. And uh, so we're happy that uh, they are joining us for this presentation as well. So uh, welcome if you're new to anything from the Historical Society. That's it for me. I will see you at the Q&As. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments. Uh, Mike and Lynn and Ben will be happy to tackle uh, any questions that do come up. Uh, but here we are in uh, tonight's presentation. Enjoy. Maybe. <laughs> all, all an adventure, I tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right, enjoy. Milwaukee may be synonymous with beer, but for many people, its socialist past is little more than a quirky piece of 1990s pop culture. So, do you come to Milwaukee often? I think one of the most interesting aspects of Milwaukee is the fact that it's the only major American city to have ever elected three socialist mayors. Does this guy know how to party or what? Huh? Alice Cooper is right. And he points to a little known chapter in American history that has increasing relevance today. Socialist mayors were the rock stars of the age. They were the ones that did things. They were the protesters, the radical people who changed the world.
appearing as if we're not. Apparently, we're having some issues with some sound. So I'm sorry, but apparently we're getting uh, uh, no sound, which is which is weird. Um, but you've got some of the images of what we're going to be going on, and we'll just kind of roll with it. So sorry about that technical difficulty. I'll let uh, Ben Barbera take it from here. Thanks, John. OK, well, uh, Lynn, Michael, thank you very much for being here tonight. And to everybody who's watching, I promise you the documentary looks a lot better than that clip that we just showed. <laughs> has sound. It's not in stop motion or anything silly like that. Uh, Mike, Lynn, uh, again, thank you for being here. And um, I really enjoyed the documentary. I thought it was uh, a very impressive introduction to Milwaukee's socialist history. Um, let's just start right here. Let me ask you, uh, what motivated you to try to tell this story? No, oh, sir. I think um, there were a couple of things, Ben. Um, one is, and uh, we talk about, you know, state fair and dates and times, and this has been sort of a surreal summer, um, but uh, we should already be past the Democratic National Convention, at least in its original configuration here in Milwaukee. Now, of course, it's going to be upcoming and a much uh, con condensed version of what was envisioned. But Mike and I thought about that. We knew that there the a political uh, spotlight would be on Milwaukee during that period of time and leading up to it, and that this story would get uh, probably uncovered. Um, and But that there was more to it than the typical minute 30 treatment that reporters are often given in, in storylines. So our intent was to, to uh, try and shine a light on this story, which we felt other than uh, maybe what the historical uh, society has done, what John Goethe has written extensively about in his book, The Making of Milwaukee, we decided that this was a story that really was underreported and unknown to a lot of what we consider to be curious and uh, curious people who like to know these kinds of things about their community. And, and then the other uh, uh, is the obvious. Uh, the, the word socialism is is so much a part of our political conversations today. It will be throughout this fall. And so we thought the, the combination of that, the political spotlight being on Milwaukee this summer, and the fact that, that socialism uh, is talked a lot about that, we thought, what better than to take a look at what socialism looked like in one American city over a period of nearly a half century. Uh, we're not saying that's today's socialism. We're not making those judgments in the, in the uh, film at all. What we're saying is it's an interesting part of American history. Absolutely. And for those people who, the few people out there who maybe haven't seen the documentary yet, uh, I thought that maybe we should start out by unpacking this, this story a little bit about uh, American socialism, but more specifically, Milwaukee's version of socialism, which is uh, really completely unique uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, and so uh, can you start out by, by telling the people where maybe uh, socialism got its beginning, at least the Milwaukee version of it? It's, it's a very heavily ethnic uh, brand of socialism. Uh, many of the Germans who came to Milwaukee uh, after about 1850 or so, uh, they brought some of their political experiences and political knowledge with them. And so Milwaukee found itself, they, they settled in, in one of the most German places in America, which was the state of Wisconsin. And they came here and they began to be uh, very active politically. Uh, so, so it's the ethnicity that is a big part of, of Milwaukee's experience. You combine that with organized labor, uh, the rise of organized labor in America, uh, Milwaukee was a hotbed for that that labor activity. And so you put those factors together and then combine it with the fact that Milwaukee uh, uh, was certainly a city with some political corruption issues and a filthy city uh, with sanitation issues galore. And so you combine all of those things together and that's how you get this Milwaukee brand of socialism, which we should say, um, sort of changed over the years, became mm -hmm. a little bit more pragmatic and more uh, just based on problem solving as time went on. And um, and and as Mike said, the city was dirty uh, physically because we were an industrial city and we did not have the kind of uh, workplace protections that you would see much more of today. Uh, and the city was also dirty from a political standpoint. Uh, the first, uh, the mayor at the time, you have a shot of him here, David Rose, 
uh, what had how many people oh, indicted oh, in? Uh, well, David Rose is oh, on I'm the sorry. left. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, how many indictments against David Rose and people in his administration? It was like uh, two hundred and yeah, some near indictments. Three, near 300, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so that's how the uh, as Mike said this this movement powered by ethnic you know ethnic uh, an ethnic group Germans and labor uh, were po they how they were powered. And they uh, they ran a, and and they ran as sewer socialists. They were going to clean up the city, and uh, and we did not have running water. And then there were horses, and so you can just imagine the the the, the grime of the city. And so the socialists uh, vowed to clean up both. They vowed to clean up government and to clean up the city. I would say, you know, uh, Ben, they, they they were reformers at heart. That's what I would call them at the the start of sort of their 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 reign in Milwaukee, their era in Milwaukee, they were really talking about reforming many aspects of life in the city. Exactly. Um, so some of the slides I have here, so example, for example, as you said, the, the German influence, uh, Matilda Anarchy, she was uh, one of the 48 or these are the Germans that mm -hmm. came over after the revolutions in, in 1848 in the German principalities. And uh, they were free thinkers and, and real, um, sort of uh, forward thinkers, is, if you will, and the Turners as well. Uh, and then you mentioned the labor movement. So we've got uh, Paul Grotkow, who is one of the more um, sort of hardcore early socialists from the 1870s and 80s who came to Milwaukee and really started um, sort of helping the workers to agitate for the um, for the eight hour workday, which was the big issue, and then also um, other workers' rights. Um, Victor Berger is, is probably the guy that um, that makes it all happen in Milwaukee. Without him, uh, you know, socialism might very well have have uh, died on the vine. And, and uh, one of the things that um, is often referred to as this Milwaukee idea where he was the one who was able to uh, marry the labor movement with politics. Um, and, in, and that in and of itself is very different from what other socialists were trying to do. Can you guys expand on, on that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think what uh, Victor Berger did is he was he was a pragmatist in some ways. Lynn mentioned it earlier. There there were kind of different factions of socialism in in the country at that time. There were the East Coast socialists who who truly talked about revolutionary change, and and Berger uh, was about winning elections. He was about enacting change because the socialists had won elections. So. In some respects, he was considered not sufficiently revolutionary by the East Coast socialists, but he had a very pragmatic approach to, to uh, moving forward to accomplish socialist goals. And he did it through uh, just a, a very effective use of mass literature drops, mobilization of organized labor, um, German speaking newspapers, including his own. Uh, helping drive that that new energy in the city. So Berger, uh, I think John Goethe referred to him as as the Moses of, of mm -hmm. the socialist movement mm -hmm. that led the socialists to the promised land, meaning the fact that they were actually governing in a city like Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned the newspapers, which were absolutely essential for the socialists. So what we have here are a few um, photos from the Milwaukee leader, which was the leading, leading socialist voice. Uh, and, and it's interesting, um, I don't know how well our viewers can see them, but we've got uh, in one corner, we've got reporters working on stories. In another corner, we've got uh, a room full of women working for the newspaper and then um, a bunch of employees in, in the first shot. And for 30 or 40 years, I believe um, this this really was the voice of, of socialism. Uh, but it was just one, as you said, it was one part of this organized network of leaflets and and uh they did it in multiple languages so that they could get, reach the german audience and the polish audience uh and, and anybody else who might listen uh and so as early as 1904 we start seeing um socialist aldermen being elected so i mean if you think about it the socialist party at this point has been around for seven or eight years uh, and they've already made inroads in milwaukee which is is amazing um Let's uh, let's see. Let's talk about our first socialist mayor, Emil Seidel. What can you uh, what can you say about him? Well, he was uh, uh, he was elected in 1910. Uh, again, he he came to power in part because David Rose was considered corrupt, and in part because the city was filthy and needed change. So, Seidel comes in, very very smart guy. Um, he comes in with very uh, grandiose dreams. He was more of what. 
um, maybe socialism is often thought of is that we're going to have government start to, to have ownership of industries, mm -hmm. control of businesses. And so he pushed pretty hard for dramatic change in the two years that he was in office. And that was a standard term. Yeah, mayor, right? mayoral elections were for two years back then. Mm -hmm. So he uh, he pushed very hard that, you know, they pushed the labor issues, Ben, that you referred to the eight hour workday, trying to raise the minimum wage. Um, but but some of his actions you could say that that in, in the eyes of the people of Milwaukee, he may have overreached a bit. And so in 1912, after only two years in office, he was defeated in an election that featured both Democrats and Republicans combining forces to make sure there was not a socialist. They ran a fusion candidate yes. against him and, and they defeated him. But as you well know from your role there with the historical society socialism was just getting started and and Seidel, we should say it's not like he didn't do anything after that he was mm -hmm. a vice presidential candidate That's for the right. national socialist party he ran with eugene debs so he he still had a political career but his career as mayor in milwaukee was fairly short-lived and then the socialists got pretty smart to the fact that mm -hmm. they could be hard-nosed about philosophy or they could win elections where they actually got to govern and, and Dan Hone was, in fact, uh, a, a change agent in that sense that, that uh, in the film, we interviewed Dan Hone's grandson, Dan Steininger, who, mm -hmm. who talks a lot. Dan Hone lived with, the, with, Dan, with Dan Steininger's family mm -hmm. in his last years of life. So they had a lot of transfer of information and, and uh, history that was going on during that time. But Dan Steininger talked about how his grandfather said, if it ain't working, then change it. <laughs> and that's what Dan Hone realized is that governance was going to require a, a, a different adaptation of socialism. Yeah. Fascinating guy. Fascinating figure in Milwaukee history. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of my favorite stories is, uh, I mean, he, he grew up in Waukesha uh, and uh, his father was a, a real hardcore radical um, to the point where uh, one of the people who was accused of the Haymarket bom bombing in Chicago uh, fled the city and hid out at Dan Hone's house. So he's a kid and he's being influenced by these radical ideas. Um, so you can see where he gets the, the radical chops from. But yeah, as you point out about the socialists in general, he's also very pragmatic. Uh, and he realizes that the only way you're going to affect change is to make it work uh, in the mainstream, if you will. And, uh, you know, Victor Berger was the one who created the infrastructure, but Dan Hone is the one who really sort of takes it and runs with it. Yeah. Um, that, you know, and Ben, he had that, um, the start for him in many, many respects was like 1911, where he was the, the author of one of the nations, if not the nation's first workman's compensation law. And so as city attorney. Yeah, he was Milwaukee city yeah. attorney. And, and so yeah. he had that people liked that about him. They saw him as a fighter for their cause. And so in 1916, the socialists get get reelected and Dan Holm begins the first of what would be, what, 24, 24 years year run in office. Yeah. As, yeah. Mm hmm yeah, I mean, uh, he he made his name fighting the uh, a lot of big business, you know, corrupt business as well as a city attorney. And once people saw that he could get things done, and and that that was really what he was about was getting things done. Uh, if we look at his efforts during World War One, look at his efforts during the Depression, um, he didn't worry about doing what was necessarily politically correct or even what would necessarily um, promote his career. He just was thinking about, okay, these are the things that I need to do to help my people. And that's really what the socialists were about. We're about helping the people. Correct? Well, you referenced <laughs> earlier, Ben, that this that none of these mayors was a, a solo act. Um, at that particular time when Dan Hone was uh, becoming mayor and running for re-election in those early years, he had a, a common council mm. that was also majority socialists. Uh, and he also uh, had help on the county side. There were judges, uh, Charles Whitnell, you know, the architect of the Milwaukee County Park System was a socialist. So there, there, were, uh, there was a lot of, uh, of synergy in the community uh, on multiple fronts because these folks all ascribed to this socialist thinking. And then he was smart enough to realize as a pragmatic politician that when the socialists began to lose some of their influence, some of their power in city government, he began to figure out ways he could still work with others 
to move forward with things that he felt were absolutely vital to the city. So he was a very shrewd political mind in addition to being a, you know, a pretty strong leader. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you were, you were speaking of uh, the county figures, Frederick Heath. I've included him here because he, uh, I, think, I believe it was Victor Berger said he was the first uh, Yankee socialist. Um, but he was, he was a, a county supervisor for something like 36 years or whatever. And, and we owe him a debt of gratitude because he actually founded, was one of the founders of the Milwaukee County Historical Society. Uh, and he, um, in that role and as director for many years, uh, he um, you know, donated tons of socialist uh, paperwork and pamphlets and stuff like that to our collection. So a lot of the way we tell the story is is through Frederick Keith here. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, let's see, where am I going? Okay, here am I going. Uh, so Dan Hone was in power for 24 years, um, but all good things come to an end. Can uh, can you uh, uh, tell the folks about at the end of Dan Hone's career and what came next? Well, th this is actually in in the film. This is probably one of the the in some respects, it was one of the more lighthearted parts of the film. Uh, Dan Hone in 1940 gets a, a real different style opponent, and that is Carl Zeidler. And Carl Zeidler, Zeidler is a familiar name to Milwaukeeans, but Carl Zeidler, uh, as was described by his niece and as described by Dan uh, Hone's grandson, uh, he was this handsome, charming candidate of today. He would sing God Bless America at every political rally he would go to. His politics were not precisely clear. We've asked people about that. And well, this, and, 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 and uh, uh, Gene Zeidler, Car uh, Carl's niece and Frank's daughter said, I'm not sure that Uncle Carl was a, a Republican. Some people said he was, but she wasn't sure about that. So what he wasn't was a socialist. That's what he right. was not. And so he was wrong at this time. And Dan Hone, uh, according to Dan Steiniger, just didn't take, take him, him seriously. seriously. And it cost him the election mm -hmm. in 1940. And, and we found what we think may have been one of the only recordings of Carl Zeidler singing God Bless America at the oh, Milwaukee wow. Public Library. It was still in an old record form. We've subsequently yeah. had it digitalized, so they now have it in their files for future use, and we were able to include a little snippet of him singing God Bless America. But he was really what you would call in today's vernacular a modern-day candidate. Yeah. Balloon drops at his events, gorgeous women on each arm. I mean, it was very, very intentional that he didn't talk about policy, but uh, people gravitated toward him. It was his personality, it was magnetic, and he was fresh and a fresh voice and a fresh face. And Gene Seidler said the same thing. Um, he really he really captured people's imagination as this sort of fresh voice yes. in a political very, uh, world. Very skilled politician. One of the things we heard, and, and Gene uh, talked a lot about that, Gene Seidler, his niece, said that um, you know had he lived, uh, he would have been a formidable national politician. Very, very big political future ahead of him. And as you can see from the screen, uh, he died. Uh, he, he enlisted in the military during the war. There's a lot of And he went off to sea mm -hmm. and he died. And it took a long time to even try to figure out exactly how he died. Um, but that was the end of Carl Zeidler's time as mayor and the end of what was a, certainly a very promising political future. That's right. Some, but not a socialist. Yeah, not a socialist. And it would have been interesting <laughs> had he come back from yeah. his military duty. Uh, what impact would that have had on his on his brother, Frank yeah. Seidler? Yeah. Was there room for Frank Seidler? Um, right. It it just it would have reshaped the political landscape. Virtually everyone we talked with agreed if Carl Zeidler had not died in service. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, as you said, uh, Carl Zeidler um, enlisted in the Navy, uh, died in 1942, I believe. And John bon Bone or Bond came in was, uh, to finish out that administration, then was reelected. Uh, but then in 1948, um, Carl Zeidler's brother ran for mayor. Uh, as a socialist, and, and here was another um, diehard socialist. He he joined the Socialist Party, I believe, in, in you know in his early twenties, uh, and so in the nineteen thirties. Um, let's talk a little bit about about Frank Seidler and his administration. You had an opportunity to interview Frank 
we were so fortunate to have him in this community for a long time. Mm -hmm. So you you interviewed him yeah. and um, and he never backed away from that no. socialist uh, those roots that you're describing, Ben. He never ever yeah. walked away from that. His story is so fascinating because you know you're thinking 1948, and so we're after the war, but we're already beginning to. to, to the, the socialists had always wrestled with the fact that that people sometimes equated them with with communism. And so that was something they had going against them. And Frank made no secret of the fact that he was a socialist. Now, in those days, you started running with other people as part of an alliance, and uh, it was not technically a partisan office, but Frank was very clearly uh, a socialist. And so to be able to be A, elected, and B, to govern for 12 years, that's a pretty remarkable story in itself. And as we always say, the thing that jumped out at us, you know, if you think about it, he arguably was the nation's most uh, powerful and certainly best known socialist, Frank Zeidler, and he's governing and reelected at the time of the Red Scare. Joe McCarthy, the Wisconsin Senator's Red Scare, his anti-communism crusade. You've got Frank Zeidler, the socialist, mm -hmm. McCarthy, the anti-communist, and they seem to somehow coexist. Yeah, well, and Ben's got a wonderful picture yeah. there from the Historical yeah, Society. That, night. Look at what's that. wrong with this picture? <laughs> um, today's world, they wouldn't be standing next to each other, um, probably. But you have this beautiful picture, which is picture, which ben, is in the yeah. film. Yeah. Uh, the the picture is of uh, Frank Seidler and Joe McCarthy looking over Joe McCarthy's election <laughs> results, and um, and to Mike's point, we asked Gene about that about why these why did they not go after each other uh because we know how effective the uh senator was uh in in, in excoriating people that he felt were not to be trusted uh in government and she said interestingly she said first off my father had a a a, a certain amount of humanity mm -hmm. about him that he always tried to see the humanity in other people but he also she said he also said that he thought it was Joe McCarthy's alcoholism that was speaking uh, and that his his drinking related problems got in the way of his political uh, uh, vernacular and that um, he seemed to reserve his venom for people more out state than here in Wisconsin. But they 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 certainly weren't close pals, but they did not cross each other, which is which was fascinating. Absolutely. Um, so uh, Frank Seidler, um, he he worked hard and, and, and had a lot of, uh, as we say today, headwinds uh, during his administration. Um, so he was mayor from 1948 to 1960. During that time, Milwaukee was was changing dramatically in a lot of different ways. And, and Seidler was um, uh, hard pressed from a lot of, on a, a lot of different sides to to deal with the issue. Can you talk a little bit about um, some of the things that Zeidler did under his, his administration? Yeah, I, I I would list a, a few of them. First of all, the city of Milwaukee. The, he's got three. It, it, yeah, ex ex three uh, the excellent. annexation. Yeah, mm -hmm. they they annexed just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of acres of land. He gobbled up land. Uh, that was the, the geographic change in the city of Milwaukee is probably one of the biggest things you can attribute to Frank Zeidler. Um, you want to talk about expressways? Do, do, well, Gene Zeidler had a great line, though, about what he thought about. <laughs> well, first off, he thought it was inefficient to have all these suburban governments. He thought that we should be working toward a more common good. Yeah. And was it was it or was it John Goethe? There was a great line yeah, that, that we, uh, you know, Something how well we we know they're there, but we don't acknowledge their right to exist. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the yes, and 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 Frank Zeidler, and this is again another one of these sort of things that people go really uh, when you tell them Frank Zeidler was a huge proponent of freeways in the early going. Uh, the freeway, or what we called Stadium Freeway, which uh, Stadium, uh, North, uh, Stadium yeah. North, which effectively allowed County Stadium to get built, and eventually had uh, the zoo move out of Washington Park and off where it's in its current location. But Frank Seidler thought that freeways were kind of ways for people to connect to jobs and people it, movers. They yeah. were they were efficient yep. un until it became apparent that it was also very efficient for them to leave the city and move out to the suburbs. 
At which point, not only did he recognize that that was a that was an economic drain on the city, but also as freeways were going up, it was disproportionately affecting uh, parts of the community, the African American community, which were still relatively new arrivals at that time in Frank's early part of Frank's administration. But it was devastating those neighborhoods. And, um, and we never recovered from it. The reason why, as you see a, a photo here of, of Mayor Zeidler welcoming uh, some of the new families to the Hillside Housing Project, um, the, the, the mayor was a firm believer in public housing because we had taken down so much housing during freeway development that it was one way to um, give people a safer and healthier place to live. And, and just one other thing on that, Ben, you know, the word blight is mentioned in there. And, and this is a, a it was a, a big problem for Milwaukee then as as it is today, unfortunately. But you, you saw uh, so many parts, well, not so many, but parts of the city were just in really uh, not good shape. And unfortunately, if you were African-American and you moved to Milwaukee, you could find work but you couldn't find the kind of housing you wanted your family mm -hmm. to live in. It was dilapidated, it was run down. And so you had to figure out a way uh, to, to live within that reality. And you know, we talked to Howard Fuller, we interviewed him for the film, and some people don't know that the, the former MPS superintendent and uh, just retired uh, Marquette University educator, um, he lived in Hillside. He was one of the first residents there. His family moved from a home on the north side to Hillside, and he said, we thought it was great. It was a big improvement from where we were living. So Seidler was trying to make inroads. He was trying to improve living conditions, but that was an ongoing problem. The problem of blight, the problem of housing for, for people of color in Milwaukee during that time. Mm -hmm. Which uh, brings up the, the next topic I wanted, wanted to discuss. Um, so we've sort of, uh, uh, for those who don't know, uh, Seidler, like I said, he um, chose not to run in 1960. Uh, Henry Meyer, a Democrat, um, one and then went on to serve for 28 years because in Milwaukee we we love long serving uh, mayors. Um, but uh, getting back to um, sort of the socialists uh, in a broader perspective and and in thinking about a lot of the issues that we're talking about today, um, what are your thoughts on on the Milwaukee socialists on the issues of of race and minorities and people of color? Um, where where do you think uh, how to how to put this? Um, where do they fit in sort of the the pantheon of of their contemporary politicians? We don't need to necessarily compare them to today's politicians because it's a different world now. But where did they fit in with with the other politicians of their era? Well, I think you have a couple of of different pieces to that answer. So. The socialists, the people we interviewed, John Nichols, uh, other people of uh, John Goethe, said that the socialists, frankly, wrestled with the race issue. It was it was not uh, something that that they can look back on and say, "Wow, we really did well on that." In fact, Victor Berger, uh, who was really the, the the guy who led the way uh, in his early years, he was a racist. He we at, at a convention. Uh, he made it very clear he did not think that that black people were equal to white people. So you had that part of the party. Um, but later on, you had Frank Zeidler, who was seen as someone who was welcoming to the city's newest residents, as someone who was trying in his in his own way to address some of the issues. Um, but overall, I would say that they still had plenty of work to do on the issue of race. They did. And, race in our and, community. and um, uh, Margot Anderson and Jean Seidler both talk about this. Margot from UWM uh, talked about the uh, that, it, it, and it's you have to look at the time. Of course, it um, it wasn't just an issue of uh, of of incorporating and welcoming um, people of color. Women were also noticeably absent from political leadership in those days. And so it was not. Uh, it was not just about race. It was. It was about gender too. And one of the challenges that um, the socialists face, and and and, is Frank Seidler was trying to frame the housing issue as sort of an economic justice issue, when in fact it was rooted in race. And okay. and folks talk about that in the film that these were Milwaukee's new immigrants, their newest residents 
were people coming from the South, African-Americans that wave coming from the South to the North. Interestingly, a lot of other urban areas, including Chicago, had more of the movement from the South to the North occurring after World War I. Right. In Milwaukee, it came later, and it was very compressed because we were hungry for workers with growing industrial base. And um, unfortunately, uh, there, the city did not move to welcome African Americans in the same way that they welcomed the German immigrants. And um, Margo Anderson talks about that 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 there was a there was a race issue within the with even within the German community too. The mm -hmm. acceptance that it was different than what was the the prototypical wave of people who came to Milwaukee in the early part of the century. So it, the race was always woven in there. Frank was trying very, very hard to make it more about economic justice. The housing was about economic justice and good working and clean living conditions yeah. and good schools for everybody. And as you well know, Ben, I mean, really the race issue was one of the reasons why Zeidler stepped down. He did run for reelection in 56, he was elected, but even at that time he was, he was very, um, as his daughter said, very, mm -hmm. and, and physically and emotionally drained because it became a very hostile environment. He was accused of, of you know, uh, encouraging uh, black residents of the South to come and live in Milwaukee, of even paying people to come and live in Milwaukee. And so he faced a lot of opposition on the issue of race in Milwaukee. And I think by 1960, people forget Frank Zeiler was only 48 years old when he left office. Mm -hmm. By 1960, his daughter said he was drained. He was mm -hmm. done. He, he had been in the hospital. He had he was ready to leave mm -hmm. office, exhausted. Absolutely. Uh, and Lynn, you mentioned mentioned women, and, and uh, that was going to be the second uh, topic I brought up, this being the uh, 100th anniversary of, of the ratification of, of the women's right to vote. Um, again, I think we see uh, some ambivalence on the part of the socialists. Um, as far as the, the women's suffrage issue, uh, or at least early on. Um, but what, what's interesting is a lot of the uh, grassroots effort for the socialists, the workers behind the scene, the people uh, organizing the rallies um, and helping with the leaflets, a lot of them were women. Um, and then there were some prominent women as well too. They, some of them happened to be wives of prominent socialist men like uh, Meta Berger here mm -hmm. and Annie Whitnell, who is uh, Charles Whitnell's wife. But, and then there was Elizabeth Thomas who, uh, I don't think it's talked about much, but uh, she was actually a socialite, a New York socialite who moved to Milwaukee and was the secretary for the Socialist Party for a, a number of years. And this is not the secretary who writes and takes notes. This is like the organizing secretary that, that makes things happen. Uh, and she actually helped finance the, the party as well. Um, so uh, again, in, in the light of, of the times, it's, it's interesting to look at this fairly forward thinking um, party uh, certainly for their era, but these two major factors to, that we think about today were not necessarily top of the radar for the for the that's socialists right. in Milwaukee. Yeah, it's, that's right, Ben. And I think, um, you know, one of the things we talk about in the film is obviously we talked about how the socialists came into power, how they governed and what it looked like in a day to day sort of way. Um, we also talk about why it ended, because effectively in 1960 with Henry Meyer's election and uh, Frank uh, Zeidler's exit, uh, the Socialist Party as we knew it in Milwaukee all but ended. Yeah, and uh, and and there are some factors behind that. Um, one is that in order to have a successful political movement, you've got to build a young pipeline, new new leadership, new yeah. leadership, and um, mm -hmm. I think that that was that was one of the failings. Could some of that leadership have come out of the women ranks? Could it have come out of people of color uh, that were, you know, a growing uh, portion of the city's population? Um, the socialists did not figure that out, and um, and it it in in the end, I think it it contributed to the 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 era ending, all but ending, as we've said. And I think you know there was the issue of communism that definitely had a a it took its toll on the party. Frank Zeidler knew that one of his speaking engagements, I think in Chicago, he talked about how this is hurting us. Uh, Zeidler and the Milwaukee socialists were not uh, communists. They were not fans of communism. The, the, they saw that as more of a totalitarianism that they did not endorse, um, but they knew they were being tarred by that same image. 
And and then, you know, and we mentioned Dan Hone earlier. I, this is the other story that, that we heard from Margo Anderson and John Gerda and John Nichols and other people who told this. In some respects, the, the Democrats with the New Deal and uh, and their policies as they move forward really borrowed heavily on not just socialist mm -hmm. rhetoric, um, but socialist policies. So you see some of that reflected in the New Deal, and it raises the question of why do we need socialists? If the Democrats are talking about this, <laughs> why do we need to do that? So, you know, by 1960, there just was not a big longing for socialism. And and so I think that had another and, big impact. And Jean Seiler kept asking her father right to the end of his life, you know, why do why you continue you to be a socialist? <laughs> and he said, because third parties have ideas that need to get out there. And third parties can push those ideas out there. And ultimately, mainstream parties begin to listen a little more. And in the case of some of the socialist ideas, I mean, we had workers' compensation yeah. for city employees years before this became the norm across America. That was Dan Hone, as we mentioned early on. And, uh, and no, eight-hour workday, the things that we, social security, the things that we we take sort of for granted to now, they were considered radical mm -hmm. back in, in that era, but now are just sort of things and, and the, given. And as Dan Steininger said, the Democrats stole some of the socialists' best ideas. They weren't dummies. They could see, you know, that some of these things had Very merit. politically popular. Too. And yeah, yeah. And so they, the, the other party sort of cherry-picked things that kind of made the socialists unnecessary. Yeah, those are all great points. Um, so uh, in our last few minutes, I want to um, go uh, switch directions just slightly and um, have the two of you talk a little bit about actually creating this documentary and telling this story. So as the curator here at the Historical Society, uh, my job is to tell stories. And, and, and I just happen to have told the political history story recently. Um, but when I do it, I, I have to deal with this huge volume of information. I have to figure out a way to condense it down to a smaller volume of information, uh, make it relevant and make it accessible, uh, which from having spoken to you two before seems to be exactly what you have to do with a documentary. So how did you do that? <laughs> in, in 56 minutes. minutes and 46 seconds. Exactly. <laughs> we, had to, we had to compress it. <laughs> How did we do it? Well, you know, you... you we start with good filmmaker partners. Yeah, we had uh, Steve Betcher and Mike Trinkline were our filmmaking partners. They've done a ton of work for PBS over the years and are really highly regarded. Mm -hmm. And so um, they, uh, Steve shot the, the film for us. Um, it's beautifully shot and we have a chance to show the pictures again. It's really an amazing. Maybe we can um, put those clips on your website and people can yeah. come back and watch them. But it's yeah. beautiful. It's and beautiful. actually John said he got the uh, clip fixed oh. so we can play it at the end as we go oh, out. Good, right. good, good. But good. It's, it's beautifully shot. And so, so the challenge is, okay, here's a story uh, that we want a national audience to, to hear how do we do this? And, and there are different techniques that filmmakers use. We did not use a straight chronological uh, uh, exploration of the socialist era. We tried to focus on the things that they did, the things that happened, the things that we thought would be of most interest to a national audience, as well as a Milwaukee audience. And then you have to figure out how do we illustrate it in a way that captivates an audience today. And and Link could talk about this, but one of the things we did, we did some things with Steve and Mike, did some things with animation mm -hmm. and with uh, colorization, mm -hmm. which is, you know, can be sometimes uh, some people like that, some people don't, but we thought it was important to telling the story, to bring it to life. Exactly. And we're, you know, we're talking about a period of history that is largely black and white photos. Mm -hmm. And and, um, and you know this, Ben, because this is the world you live in every day, is how yeah. do how do you bring that story to an audience, especially since we were providing this, we, we did this film as, as, as a nonprofit venture because we wanted it to be available to educators. We wanted to be a part of talkbacks. And, you know, had we not had a pandemic, we would have been going into college campuses and classrooms. But we are still hearing from educators who definitely want to use the film as a subject of conversation. Uh, and so the idea was that we've got to uh, have a, a film that could hold for a high school class that is used to living in a YouTube world. Mm -hmm. And we still have to respect people who appreciate 
the uh, the beauty of history in the, the 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 format in which it existed. So we were mm -hmm. trying to kind of walk between those two worlds. I, I would say, you know, if, if you had to use a comparison, Ben, you know, that there was a film a few years ago, a tremendous documentary that Lynn and I saw when we were visiting family, and it was called "They Shall Not Grow Old." Peter Jackson, uh, the the famous director, looked at, at mm -hmm. World War One, and he did an amazing job of using colorization of changing up some of the speed of the film. Um, it was an incredibly ambitious project. And, and what I think it did is it, it made that era so much more real uh, to today's audience. They could appreciate the kind of combat that was taking place. And the harsh the conditions harsh that conditions. The, the British soldiers went so, through. So and, we yeah. bought, you know, I, I, that, that's an idea is how do we tell the story? And so we use some techniques to, to try and enhance that. And, and then the storytellers, as you mentioned, um, you know, we tried to find people who had strong Milwaukee connections, either mm -hmm. lifelong residents, people who grew up, who knew what socialism was, people who uh, had worked as reporters, people who had been, you know, uh, family members. John Norquist, of, former, yeah, former, former mayor. mayor. I mean, there are just so many people, uh, all of whom we felt could help tell the story in some way, add to the story. So we intentionally sought out to have Milwaukee people or people with strong Milwaukee ties tell the story because we thought that was really probably the truest way you could tell. And we also did not go into this film with a point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, we we told people very, in fact, we told the funders because they come from all political yeah, stripes and probably apolitical as well. But we told everyone, uh, we don't want to tell people what they should take away from this film. We're interested in what they have to tell us about their reactions to it. And people have been taking away a lot of different things because there's a lot in that 56 minutes and 46 seconds. Uh, and so we we really wanted the film to be more of a, uh, where people could express a, a, a a part of the story, like we have, been, you know, we have we have a Bud Selig talking about County Stadium. We didn't have a baseball team here, right. and how a major league team was not here, and Frank Sadler was hugely supportive of the new of the new stadium, which would think some, about that. Think about that today, right? Mayor In yeah, on board with the building of a a new stadium with taxpayer dollars. Yeah, That's, yeah, uh, and, and he, willing to contribute, you know, by doing the north. Stadium North uh, Freeway project. Yeah, so. so so we wanted we 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 were surprised even as we interviewed people. We did not realize we were going to talk with Sheila Cochran, who's a retired uh, labor leader here in Milwaukee, and our intent was to talk more about the labor piece, which didn't get into the film as much as we would have liked. But we ended up because of what Sheila shared with us that she lived in Frank Seidler's neighborhood, mm -hmm. and as a woman of color. She talked about what that what his work at that time meant to her as a girl growing up in that neighborhood. So it, it Howard surprised us when he said, "Well, you know, my family lived at Hillside. It was pretty spanking new, and we thought we were really, you know, we really yeah. rocked by being able to live at Hillside." So um, we found out things even in our conversations with people that we didn't know. Uh, so they enlightened us uh, through the interview process. They really did. That's great. Yeah. You know, um, as a historian, as somebody who's familiar with this story, uh, I was going into your documentary. I was very curious to see how you would do it. Um, and, and as and as I watched it, you know, initially with the with the colorization of the photos, I was like, well, that's an interesting technique because I'm familiar with all the photos. I'm used to the black and white version. Uh, mm -hmm. But you're right. It really does come alive. And then the fact that um, uh, you cut in so many uh, shots of modern day Milwaukee to help connect the, the, the two stories, the, the, the historic story to what we see today in the city. Uh, I think it was it was ultimately effective. Um, I wish there had been time for more of like the labor story uh, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But yeah, I, I certainly understand the constraints of, in your case, time. In my case, it's usually words uh, and I'm way too wordy for my own good. <laughs> so I certainly understand. Um, so uh, unless you two have anything else you wanna add, I think we're gonna turn it back to John and. Um, let him uh, uh, give us some questions from the audience. So before we do that, I, I think I figured out what I did wrong with the video at the beginning. Oh. We're gonna try this. My wife is literally in the next room and I'm like, as soon as this thing doesn't work, you tell me so we don't, you know. <laughs> anyway. 
it's all, okay. it's all like this big learning experience of working digital. Because every like I will tell you the number one question right now is how can I watch it? So um so mm -hmm. let's see if we can get just this uh, little trailer going here. Um and fingers crossed. All right. So Milwaukee may be synonymous with beer, but for many people, its socialist past is little more than a quirky piece of 1990s pop culture. So, do you come to Milwaukee often? I think one of the most interesting aspects of Milwaukee is the fact that it's the only major American city to have ever elected three socialist mayors. Does this guy know how to party or what? Huh? Alice Cooper is right. And he points to a little-known chapter in American history that has increasing relevance today. Socialist mayors were the rock stars. Of the and we lost it again. But I don't think people understand it. You know, the pure socialism is the yeah. government's ownership of the means of production. That was not what socialism was about here. Even though there may have been some discomfort with the rhetoric of socialism, there was a feeling that Milwaukee worked. The public had trust in government. Unlike its beer, the city's socialism isn't world famous. But it should be, because Milwaukee offers a case study of how socialism played out in an American setting. For nearly half a century, one of the largest cities in America was run by socialists. They ended corruption, fought for better conditions for working people, and cleaned up the environment. But you've probably never heard of them, because it was policy, not publicity, that drove them. I mean, these were not um, charismatic, flashy ideologues. There was a kind of sense that these are our people. As interest in socialism increases, one heartland city has a surprising story to tell, electing three socialist mayors and the first socialist member of the U.S. Congress. What happened in Milwaukee was the biggest political story. They were the vanguard of experimenting with things that governments have never thought to do. This didn't happen in some small liberal enclave. This was a fiscally conservative city that at the time ranked among the nation's largest. The story of these 20th century Midwestern socialists offers insights into why this brand of American socialism succeeded for a time and why it ended. Socialism gets such a dirty rap, but I think it's just the rhetoric without understanding. Back then, socialism hadn't quite been stigmatized the way it was later on. And it was considered just sort of normal, if you will, that, yeah, we've been in the socialist city and they did good things. So this was a city that was built really under socialist mayors. And this was a period of incredible prosperity. This was really when Milwaukee became the machine shop of the world. They became the avant-garde experimenters, the proponents of the what people thought were outrageous ideas, and made it work. It's the story of America's socialist experiment. Yay! Yay. <laughs> no angry people commenting at me. <laughs> we, don't, we don't want anger we want to no. have we want no. happy people it's, uh, so what, what happened was i i turned took myself out and turned my mic off uh, the first time and apparently i can't do that and still stream something to people ah, well, so thank you for everybody for yeah. learning and, experience for all of us. and we do yeah. have, we do have an airing date for it that's upcoming yeah, yeah. On, oh, on monday the 27th uh july 27th um, now, we've been on Channel 10 and 36 a number of times. This time, I th is it at 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock on the 27th? We'll, we'll check that and we, so you can share it. Um, PBS on P It's on, as you know, PBS stations program a number of channels, including a, uh, one that's called World, that Milwaukee Public uh, Television um, does program. And so if, if you're looking for it, if you ha I think you have to have a cable. Uh, spectrum, so it is available. Um, that's where, and we know that our friends at 10 and 36, they've been, as we said, yes, awesome to us. There, we expect that with the convention coming up, there's also talk about the film getting some more airings again in the fall 
in the lead up to the election. So, um, and the other thing we promise folks is in, in soon, we're also going to stream the film for free. Um, we're just trying to have it move through the PBS family around the country right now, since they agreed very early on that they would run this and they would air it multiple times. So folks have a chance to see it there first, but we will stream it. And we're, uh, we hope to do that in probably uh, four to six weeks. Great. Well, we got some questions uh, coming yeah. that are not related to when people can see it. Um, <laughs> but, um, but check your local TV listings, and, and uh, like uh, Lynn said, uh, you know, look uh, look online as as it after it airs around the country. Uh, we'll start out with uh, John here. Um, let's see if I can get that up. So uh, John is asking, "Were Milwaukee socialists well represented in Common Council?" Because we talked a lot about mayors tonight and other figures, but what about the rest of city government? Well, when they, uh, and maybe Ben can correct sure. me, but when they, uh, um, I'll, I'll make a guess at it, not a guess, but I, I think this is correct. In 1910, I think 21 of the 35 aldermen in the city of Milwaukee, I think were socialists. So at they one had a majority. time, they mm -hmm. had a majority, mm -hmm. but that majority did not last over the years. Ben, maybe you can help me on that. Yeah, so I believe that's correct in 1910. And then uh, one time under Dan Hone, there was a majority. I think it was the 1932 election that um, when Roosevelt just swept, uh, the Democrats swept through and, and the socialists kind of rode that wave during the Depression. I think that was the one time during Holmes' administration when he also had a majority. Uh, but I mean, yeah, the, there were um, the aldermen as early as 1904. Um, so before the before there was a socialist mayor, there were socialist aldermen. And, and it wasn't a small number either. It was nine, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they continued on uh, through the 30s and 40s, and then they also served in the county government quite a bit as well. Right. Mm -hmm. um, was that unique to the, just Milwaukee? The rest of Wisconsin didn't quite spread out that way, right? Yeah, we were. You know, we looked at that, and um, and it's interesting because it really was a uniquely localized yeah. movement. Um, not that there were not socialists, as Mike mentioned earlier, on the coast. But they really were much more ascribed to what we would call the Socialist Party of America, mm -hmm. whereas Milwaukee socialists really kind of adapted to their environment. It, it, there were a few instances of people in the state legislature, but it wasn't a movement that really expanded across the state in any really significant way, which we were kind of surprised to learn. That you have, you know, the progressives uh, of emergence in Wisconsin really kind of you, you could argue uh, that socialism was not going to grow in the same way out state because the progressives were already making inroads mm -hmm. in, in their part of Wisconsin. That's right. There was already another political movement yeah. in the progressives. It and had Wakala. some similarities. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. Sure. Uh, Mary's asking, uh, you might have talked about this briefly, yeah. uh, but uh, who created the term super socialist and was it derogatory? Or it, the uh, the well, answer, ben, you know who, yes. who who created it? <laughs> oh, it's the, the East Coast socialists. They yeah. called the uh, right. Milwaukee socialists um, sewer socialists, and it was meant to be a derogatory term. But of course, being Milwaukee, we just embraced it. <laughs> well, that's right. And and the socialists, uh, you know, they had a sense of humor, uh, and they they not only embraced it, they said, "Yeah, we're worried about sewers." And we want clean drinking water and we want people to have showers and toilets. And I mean, one of the things we learned in this film is part of the reason why Milwaukee created the natatoria, those big swimming places that you may recall some years back is because people did not have running water. Yeah. They didn't have showers. It was a place to bathe as much as it was a place to swim. So the, we have to go back again to that period of time where it, the city was pretty dirty. Jean, I just got to add, Jean, oh, Jean Seiler Seiler had, had a great, great line yeah, about that, what did. you were saying, Ben, you know, it was a term of derision, but the, the Milwaukee socialists embraced it and they said, sure, you talk about your revolution, but you couldn't be elected dog catcher and we're mm -hmm. winning elections. Yeah. So that's how they viewed that. They embraced it. Absolutely. They did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One more question. I'm going to ask it, and that is this: this uh, this documentary turned out so good, um, and so one was this your first experience, the two of you producing a documentary, and two, will it be the last documentary that you produce? That's a well, good. Well, you've been involved in, with documentaries in the past. You did something that that was honored for. Yeah, uh, yeah when I worked for um, Wisconsin Public Television back in the 1990s, uh, we yes, we did a. 
a, a, a documentary on um, on the election of women. There was a, that was called the Year of the Woman, um, and we went we went out in search of whether that was in fact uh, true. Um, and so I have worked in some capacities, but not in in this intense way. And we may be new to documentaries, relatively new. We've been journalists, so we're used to telling, you know, bringing somebody's story forward. This was actually a, a way to stretch in, in a much longer uh, version uh, than what television news allowed us over the years. Um, but we did work with two accomplished filmmakers in Steve Betcher and Mike Trinkline. Uh, these guys have been doing, um, uh, they, they've done a, um, films on the pioneers of, of primetime television. They have, they did the, uh, um, the Reformation, the whole series just on the Lutheran Reformation and other interesting work. Last, last interview with Robin Williams. Like, yeah, they got it. The last interview with Robin yeah. before he died. Uh, but so yeah, you'd think about another one, wouldn't you? I, I think we, yeah. And <laughs> and then the thing is, well, we left so much stuff on the table. <laughs> this should have been five nights, uh, you know, one night, not as bad knows. I mean, man, that's, you know, you're talking about trying to get Yeah. Through. And, you know, we're not yeah. Ken Burns. So right. we don't get 19 you know, <laughs> episodes. <laughs> we would have loved to have more. Like right. said, we could have done just a segment on the labor side of this. Yeah. Uh, and it was, uh, but we certainly have had people encourage us to think about ways that we can bring some of, uh, some of the things that didn't make it into the film, maybe, you know, back into the fold in some other way. Thanks for the positive feedback. Yeah, we I'm glad that. you could try again because, <laughs> because you could say, well, that's great. I'm glad it's you guys nice, tried yeah, that. It was a nice effort, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, want thank, we want to thank the Milwaukee yeah. County Historical Society, oh, God, yes. uh, the Milwaukee Public Library and the Milwaukee County Historical Society are these beacons of just amazingly good stuff. And An encyclopedia. We, oh, my too, gosh. Great, yes. So, and, yeah. and, and folks who uh, helped us where we didn't know where some things existed or resided. Yeah. Ben was helpful on that front. The folks at the public library were, I spent a lot of time in the Frank P. Zeidler Humanities Room at the Milwaukee Public Library. I was, I was there so much, I said, I gotta get a library card. So I now have a library card, which I'm happy about. But we, we realized that we could have done a, a segment just on Frank Zeidler. He was worth. He was worth that. Uh, that mind. You, you guys are the best, really. I mean, yeah, this is, Thank you, know, you. What what you do and the stories you tell about our city and about who we are, uh, that's important stuff. That, that, that and, has to last. Yep. You know, way into the future. We can't just say this is. You know. Oh well, that's. It's important. It needs to be preserved. It still has to be curated too. You know, yeah, you can have yeah. a whole lot of good stuff, but if somebody doesn't know how to bring it to life then it sits in a vault and it's not, it's, it's yeah. not educating and, and, um, and, and informing. So we, yeah, we just want to say kudos and yeah. thank you again for, for your extraordinary exactly. help and for this opportunity yeah. to yeah. talk to your audience and your supporters about our film. So I'm going to ask you two a favor. Every time I go out into public and talk about what I do, can you come along with me and just <laughs> do what you just did? Because <laughs> you justified my existence right there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We will do it in a heartbeat. Yeah, in a fabulous right. facility. You know, yeah, um, it, yeah, we just, if people have not been there, then get down there. And you, like you said, it's safe to do it. Yep. It's safe to do it. Um, you guys are making sure of that. So yeah. um, it's a real big, big space too. So you can distance yeah, yeah. easily and stuff like that. Uh, real quick before we sign off, do you, uh, you, you said it's playing again on Monday. Can you just give another quick plug so people, if they want to watch it, they sure, can. I should have, um, I should have the channels down, but if you have a uh, spectrum cable, uh, you can watch the world channel on Milwaukee public television. They have uh, four or five channels they actually program besides 10 and 36, probably the ones we're most familiar with. Uh, the world channel is another one of their channels and it is on a uh, spectrum cable. Oh, I don't know if it's available. We understand it may not be available to dish mm. or yours, but it is definitely available. If you have spectrum, they carry all of the Milwaukee PBS channels but regardless it'll be digital at some point so yeah. which make, and, make, we will stream it and we'll keep you posted so that you can push that out absolutely uh, to, to the folks uh, who uh support um your work cool um well with, uh, with that um everybody have a terrific weekend um again our bike tour is sold out for saturday but 
Um, oh, the exact name is America's Socialist Experiment. Somebody just buy it. Yeah, we have a web. We have a website, so people can go there. And we also are pushing dates there of where the film is airing all over the country. Cool. You can do like a weird road trip. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's one for, well, yeah, Birmingham, Alabama. It's been in Fargo. It's been in, you know, large markets and small. It's fascinating. Yeah. Cool. Um, so whatever is, when we get more information on that, of course, we'll put it out to our people. Um, ben, do you have anything else? No, uh, just again, thank you, Lynn and Mike. I really appreciate uh, this time uh, to share this story and, and talk about your st storytelling experience as well. So thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Ben. You were a great moderator. Yeah. John, thank you very much. Yeah. Glad thank we you. got the video to work. Yeah. <laughs> um, in two weeks, we're going to be talking State Fair, um, uh, 7.30 that Thursday, whatever that is. In, in two weeks, we'll be in August by then, if you can believe that. Um, but uh, keep an eye out on that. Uh, MilwaukeeHistory.net has everything uh, that – all our events and stuff, as well as our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, stuff like that. And a huge thank to, thanks to Milwaukee PBS for partnering with us on mm -hmm. streaming this tonight um, and bringing our two audiences together. So uh, everybody stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, we'll see you all again soon. See you guys. Mm -hmm.